Да, идем. Три, два, один. В эфире. Добрый день. We're on air. Good day, dear participants of the conference, dear fathers, brothers and sisters, dear guests, I greet you all, all of those who are listening to us and watching us, those of you who took a part in the first session, I greet you again, those of you who have just joined. Um, our conference has to do uh, with the ecclesiological basis for the unity of the church and we are continuing now uh, at a section which is called Problems of Church Unity in the Works of 19th and 20th Century Theologians. My name is Alexander Kopirovsky and I chair um, the uh, School of Theology at St. Philaret's Institute and I will be the moderator for the session. And we have four speakers for today, Dmitry Gasak, first vice rector of St. Philaret's Institute, and he's also representing the postgraduate and graduate studies uh, at uh, St. Cyril's and Methodius program, and we have Marina Naumov, who is also a vice rector, and she's also in, uh, a postgraduate uh, student and Professor David Guzan, the professor also at St. Philaret's, and Olga Kuznetsova, who also teaches and works at St. Philaret's and is, a, and is also a, a postgraduate uh, PhD student at um, St. Cyril's and Methodius postgraduate program. Um, our first speaker will be Dmitry Gasak, the first vice rector of St. Lawrence. Please present your own topic. Uh, the, the topic was uh, the church is one, Alexei Homikov's com concept of one united church. Switch on your mic. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I am glad to greet um, everybody um, who's joined this conference on contemporary ecclesiology, orthodox ecclesiology. Uh, now, I was supposed to be the first speaker on Sobornost in the evening, but uh, for reasons beyond my control, I asked to be able to speak now. I hope this will not disrupt too much the flow of the conference. The more so that the, the idea uh, and the concept of subordinate, uh, I will not speak a lot about Homer's concept of subordinate. There's no doubt that Alexei Homer's the word concept would not be something that he would use in relation to his understanding of the unity of the church. The way he um, describes his own understanding of the unity of the church, starting from the well-known uh, um, article, which is called Church is One, for Homerkom, the word, the very word concept is far too rational and rationalistic. And it was that rational and rationalistic attitude to faith and uh, to God is something that he, he struggled against all his life. He thought rationalism was one of the main problems and, and indeed sins of Western Christianity. And, and not only did he fight against rationalism a uh, rationalistic attitude in the West, but he fought it with his own self, within his own self. He understood faith to be a free act of a human being. Rationalism, in his understanding, limits your internal freedom and therefore uh, limits your faith. Faith and freedom were one in his understanding. So when I put the word concept in the title of my own 
uh, presentation, I started sort of this internal polemic with my own, uh, with myself. He never created the concept of the one church, nor indeed the concept of Sabornas. So I would use the word concept perhaps in inverted commas here. That's the first comment to my topic. Now the second has to do with projecting this idea of unity uh, in the church, Komikov's idea, into today. Komikov saw the church and reflected upon it from a certain standpoint, from a certain point of view, as it were. It's not for nothing that he was an ex-military man and and understanding your disposition was something that he knew very well. And that choice of a position of an initial stand was something that was important for him. And this is the way he writes. He says, the unity of church is not something um, that is imagined or is an allegory. It is true. And it's the unity of a multiple members within a living body. And this is a very good example of the way he thought from within the church rather than without. And this is the way Samarin defined it, one of his disciples. So he, tr he made an attempt of renewing the very thought of the church and the very language of theology so that it could convey again the realities of the faith and spiritual experience rather than objective theological notions. And it even seems that his confessional position his, was not really a primary thing for him. From within the freedom of faith and confession of the church, he found the fullness of the church in the Eastern Christian tradition, not uh, the other way around. So the foundation of his vision um, of church unity was uh, this position of a human being and a Christian that sees, who sees and judges everything from within the church. The church is not an object of reflection to him. So in the, 19, in the 1840s, doing something like that within the environment to which he belonged, which was the high Russian society, which was, this was a hard fit to perform. He, it was the position of a person who had uh, a very serious and a very strict attitude to all the aspects of uh, church life, including fasting, uh, whereas most people in um, Russian society those days um, seemed to neglect these things. And there was a French, uh, was a French, uh, Frenchman, George de Mestre, who was living, was close to the emperor. And obviously what he, wrote about uh, Russian society of the time was somewhat prejudiced and indeed was written a little bit before Honekov. And yet some important features of the way uh, the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox faith were treated at the time you can find there. And indeed Honekov himself writes that the rights and the rules of the church were really held and despised and uh, were really despised and um, disregard. And it is in this situation that Homikov decides to talk about living faith, about the trust in the church, about the authority of the church um, that is not to be breached, that is Needs, that needs to be followed. And so he, without any sanction, 
he was he became on his in and of his own mm, uh, a phenomenon of subordinates uh, without any politics he understood him in a very sub way he understood that he was a russian by blood he was a russian by um citizenship and orthodox by faith berdyaev called this sort of behavior by homikov as voluntarism and you could see to a degree uh, uh, some voluntarism in that and homikov agreed indeed yet he said that boldness uh, that right and that power was something that he received from the church itself because he felt he was a faithful son of it. On the other hand, at the same time, at, at the same time, he was in correspondence with an Anglican deacon, Palmer, and you can see from that correspondence that this was not an easy stance to hold and that he had some doubts and painful reflections about the historic situation of the church. Obviously, he took a polemic stance and most of, of his works are written as a polemic with Western people with Catholics or Protestants, uh, Catholic or Protestant thinkers. But the interesting thing is that Homyakov, as Samarin points out, was always, always had his eyes open, as it were. Even when he talked to his opponents, Palmer, for instance, was not really an opponent was was rather a part of the dialogue but he was always sort of facing his opponents he was always and even in august 1845 round about the time when he when his catechetical um, teaching at the church that became known in his second letter to palmer konvikov admits that uh, the sort of desperation that he looks uh, at his at the West and the way he the West is separated from Orthodoxy, the same sort of desperation can be turned to him that his own uh, desire for unity is equally weak, and it's worth dwelling on that particular point because on the one hand. He expressed a very a sort of a very acute desire for unity in the Christian church. He saw that the church was really incomplete while it was divided. But on the other hand, as a person who was uh, knowledgeable in history and who could say situation, he was kind of well grounded in reality he was kind of losing the faith in the very possibility of that unity and it's worth noting uh, some well-known circumstances of his life to see uh, perhaps our own situation in a different light in some ways his situation and ours can be uh, seen as something common. In, of course, a lot of, has changed in, in almost um, one and a half centuries that have passed since his time, both in our in the East and in the West. And I think Omegov himself, Uh, if he could see the fruits of his own work in some of the things that happened, he would have rejoiced, I think. I think he would have rejoiced at, at a whole uh, theological tradition 
developing in the church based on his tradition on his um theological thought and some of his followers um Solovyov, Berdyaev, Father Sergius Bulgakov, uh, Nicholas Afanasiev and that it uh, influence had a very significant influence on the Western tradition that these that their ideas were adopted in the Christian West um at least not less than they were in the East and that they fed their ideas, fed the ecumenical movement that was so important for the church in the 20th century. And yet there was also a new uh, experience of life in the church that Komikov did not know, the new freedom of brotherhoods and communions, both in the post and pre and post revolutionary Russia and abroad. Uh, of course, even before Honekov, quite often, both in the Russian history, but not just the Russian history, when uh, people, uh, wealthy people became monks and would um, donate all their property. But Nupluev did something else. He did more. He joined he, the peasants um, and made a brotherhood, a labor brotherhood, uh, becoming a brother to them. And yet he was inspired by the very spirit of Homikov and his thought. One of the things, of course, is the, the fall of the Russian Empire, which really marked the end of a very large period in the history of the church, which Father Sergius Bulgakov called the Constantinian era. This is not something that Konikov could have foreseen. And uh, that period ended not just for the Russian church, <clears throat> that era uh, ended not just for the Russian church, and it's a very unique experience. In that Christianity, at least in the Soviet Union, it lost a lot of its historic and cultural riches, but at the same time became freer. Sergei Averinsev uh, said about it that in the Soviet Union, everything <clears throat> within the Christian tradition and the Christian culture that could be destroyed was destroyed uh, on the greatest scale. And it was only the naked faith that could survive. Averinsev then wondered at how strong and convincing faith becomes when it lives in spite of everything with just uh, the force of its own power, when there's nothing supporting it, nothing whatsoever. Another very important and precious experience of freedom, the, the Russian was something that uh, the Russian immigration accumulated. Yet we can keep going back to the old times, the old images, whether of Byzantium or, or of Rome. But going back to the old ways, ways is not something we can afford to do. It's this world that will not let us to, uh, allow us. And times and again, we find uh, confirmation of that. Though even today, it is much easier to talk about unity of the church and oneness of the church in the language of church policy where which is which is easier in a way because it, you don't have to talk about real unity it's a language uh, that rather helps preserve the status quo or sidetracks and then the uh, weaker brothers, as it were. Now, today we're talking about the logical basis for unity, and you'd think that we're in a situation where all, or almost all, the logical basis for unity have been worded and reflected upon from every possible side and aspect from every church. 
in the East and in the West. And maybe even today, we, it's hard for us to find anything new in terms of these theological foundations. And here again, we need to remember the situation that Alexei Homikov and his circle found themselves in those uh, remote years of the 19th century when I mean, the 1840s and 50s where Vladimir Solovyov was not yet known, Vatican II hadn't happened, a lot of things hadn't happened yet. And it was then that he found these theological foundations. In his faith, and despite all sorts of negative circumstances um, of both social and ecclesial life around him, he took that stance of the son of the church and from that stance entered uh, into a dialogue with his brothers in the West among Catholics and among Protestants. And I think today, this experience of Homyakov, now in the early, well, in the 21st century, where many people are losing both faith and hope and realistic prospects in the unity of the church, I think this can help us uh, regain that. Thank you, Dmitri. You've saved us a whole minute. <laughs> I, I did my best. But this is a very holistic presentation. Thank you. We understood your ideas. And I think everybody heard it well. And you could hear the voice of Homikov and his position, because obviously this is not a concept. This is very much um, a witness of the, in a very bold. I don't think it's you can really call it voluntarist. It's more like of a bold stance that he took. And I think today it's not new concepts or new definitions that we need for the unity of the church. All of it seems to have been done. But rather to have the same fire in our hearts so that again instead of being political, this becomes a real issue. And thank you for um, putting us into, into that context. Any questions? You can write in the chat or you can raise your hand and you can be given the floor. We have some time if you have, if anybody wants to ask anything. Marina, Marina Umova, please. Mm, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now, what I want to ask is this. Um, it is well known that Homikov is sometimes accused of not knowing the Orthodox tradition well enough because he didn't have any academic background. Well, at the time, it was all limited to the clergy. And sometimes people sort of think that he was, his main education was like Western philosophy, like reading Western philosophy. He read Schelling, she read, she, he read Catholics, he read Muller. And yet from what you're saying, you seem to claim that his position as the son of the church who speaks from within the church and looks and judges from the from within the church. And this is a very sort of a deeply orthodox position. But then where did it come from? 
how did it ha how did he happen to have it the question that, um, that yes thank you marina for that question you know we have a witness of many people who knew him well and his convictions uh, in the 1820s and 30s and 40s uh, stayed the same. They were really unchanged. His, I mean, his con his conviction as a as a, a, a believer, a, an Orthodox person, and many uh, of those who write who wrote uh, about him uh, stated that there was no evolution in this sense. And I think his understanding of the church did not have this sort of scholastic evolutionary character. In contrast to, say, uh, some of, uh, 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 of his friends, uh, Slavophiles, for instance, Ivan Kirevsky, he sort of was born that way. <laughs> His faith was very revelational. And you can see it in everything. And in that sense, uh, claiming that he was more educated or less educated, no, you can, you can do that, but it's just of no interest, really. You know, I've just, there's, there's a few names I have quoted, but you can make that list a lot longer. All the people, one or another, one way or another, who followed Konnikov. And it's worth noting things like that. But Diaev, when he starts his book, about Khomeikov, which which is called Alexei Khomeikov of 1914. He starts it with a reflection on what he believes uh, an as an important question, Khomeikov and ourselves. And while he finds a lot of differences in his own um, journey in life, in his social standing, in his historic situation, yet he finds a lot in common particularly in his attitude to the church and Christianity at large and, and all, all the issues that relate to that and that Armikov discussed. And I think this is proof. This is a, a testimony and really proof that he's, uh, he's, he's a very, very valuable input here. Professor Vasiliadis. A very simple and short question, not out of curiosity. Thank you very much, uh, Dmitry, for your presentation, but out of theological interest. How popular Khomyakov's ideas are now in present day Russia, not only in the church establishment, but also in the wider. Um, uh, society, in Russian society. Thank you. Thank you for this simple question. But I may not have enough time to give it justice <laughs> to give you a good answer. Uh, what I can say is that on the other, on the one hand, the ideas of Homikov cannot be popular by definition today. Popular in the sort of general sense, you know, as many things are popular today, because they're not, this is not something that can be popular in that sense. But the heritage of Homikov is being researched in the church circles and outside. 
the few thinkers, as it were, few researchers in the church really go far enough in their conclusions. Uh, for instance, in the idea of subordinates, and indeed the idea is being argued against as a concept, as an idea. Some people argue that what Homikov talks about never even really, really existed and in the historic church at all, that it has nothing to do with the historic church. And yet his name, on the other hand, his name is known and is quoted sometimes critically, sometimes uh, with agreement and approval. So, but times and again, you can hear his name. And it's not easy to forget though there are people who would like that. I will ask you the last question, a very short one. Is there a, a serious criticism of uh, Homikov's concept of the church? Well, in my opinion, the most interesting sort of thoughts from the ecclesial church from within the church, from the clergy, can, uh, can be found in Father Pavel Fandinsky. He, now, in the same time, Tomikov was studied mostly by philosophers and philologists. Theologians, obviously, just are just beginning to do it again. Thank you. Thank you. So we stop with the first presentation here and thank you, thank uh, the speaker. And we will switch on to the next topic. I think we're going chronologically. I just, I, I have, I'm sorry, I have to excuse myself. I will soon have to switch off. Yeah, we know your circumstances, thank you. Now we're doing this chronologically. We started with Homikov, we then go Aksakov, Bulgakov, Afanasyev. So this is, in, in a chronological sense, it's a very logical sequence. Now, Marina Nagumova, vice rector of St. Philorad's Institute. Рассказать нам, представить доклад о служении народа Божьего как основании единства. Our presentation is on the ministry of the people of God as a foundation for unity in the church in the ecclesiological thought of Nicholas Aksakov. Thank you. Reverend fathers, brothers and sisters, colleagues, I'd like to present indeed the views of a church historian and ecclesiologist and canonist, Nikolai Aksakov, on the ministry of the people of God as a basis for, for unity in the church. The phrase, the people of God, is only used in the Bible several times, but the notion is one of fundamental uh, notions for the biblical revelation. The New Testament uh, content of that notion uh, is um, can be found in the epistle of Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, this is addressed to all Christians because they become a new people of God born in Jesus Christ. And a contemporary exegete, Paul Achtimer, uh, Achtimer um, notes that when applied to Christians, um, the term royal priesthood, the holy people, is taken from uh, Exodus 19 6. Uh, now, the way it was lived out, uh, it was through, as it is described in Acts, in common prayer. They spent much time together in the temple. In the Eucharist, uh, they broke bread at home. In the material provisions in the church, they had, uh, they had common ownership and everything they owned was held in common. In resolving the issues of church life, 
as it happened at the council in Jerusalem and in choosing people for ministry. <clears throat> Uh, as we can see from the epistles, uh, the church, uh, it was not all as smooth. And yet, um, in this life, faith in Christ was really uh, lived out in their life and in the ministry uh, of believers. In the mid 20th century, Father Alexander Schmemann wrote that the notion of the church as the people of God became a an abstract notion with that. Um, not related to the practice of everyday ecclesial life. And you could say that in the early 21st century, that notion is all, all but extinct. Church does not really, the church now is sees itself more as, a, as an institution, a parish or a diocese, than a holy, a holy race, a holy people. And Christians often see themselves as somebody who are perpetually being saved. And to go back uh, in Russia, the first attempts to go back to this ecclesiological thinking where you see the church as a people of God, it was Alexei Homyakov when he uh, formulated the idea of subordinist, which at its basis has a teaching of the people of God as uh, the preserving force for the faith of the church. Homikov uh, believes that it is not the hierarchy that preserves the church from heresies and mistakes, but it is the very uh, body of the church, the very people that always want to preserve uh, their faith intact in, a, in agreement with the faith of the fathers, as it was stated in uh, in the uh, epistle of Eastern Patriarchs of 1848, at which Honikov rejoiced. Now, Aksakov, in his turn, uh, studied some other Christian um, manuscripts, the canons, and some of the ancient liturgical texts, and noted that uh, in many places it's, they speak of the people of God, never the people of the church and never when they talk about the clergy, they always say it's the, the, uh, the clergy of the church. So the clergy is then seen as, as ministers within the church, but the, the clergy in, in a broader sense, it is the, is the whole people because they are a royal priesthood and are called to, to serve, to minister to each other and to God and the church. A necessary prerequisite for that ministry to be of the people of God to be performed is fellowship, communion, uh, and because this is not a functional ministry, um, this is where every person in within that people um, cares about others, cares about the quality of their faith, and about growing in that faith, both for themselves and for their neighbors. Having spent a long time studying the apostolic tradition and the manuscripts and the rites and canonical uh, text, Aksaka uh, comes to the conclusion that um, in the early church, there was a very close participation of people in all the areas of its life. And he wrote an article on, of that, on that. He said uh, that that participation needed to be restored, that every act in the church is not only performed by the priest, but with uh, the prayer for and spiritual participation of the whole of the people of God, and that all the uh, liturgical texts testify to the fact that the very meaning uh, of the prayers is such that they must be said on behalf of all people and by the people. And uh, the secret prayers specifically, he says, uh, he says that when it says that these prayers are to be read secretly or tied, 
he basically says that this is never um, about making them secret. It's about them having to do with God's mystery and therefore referred to their sacramental nature. He also saw people as a guardian of the true teaching um, and in uh, opposing heresies. He says that the main role of the people of God has to do with preserving the tradition of the church. He says it keeps the faith that is based on tradition, therefore he is the preserver of tradition. But, and it's the whole of the people of God that preserve that apostolic tradition. Uh, to him, a proof of that was that, that even the ecumenical councils had to be received by the church. This is when an ecumenical council becomes one only when the church and the people, the clergy and the people receive them as such. At point three, he says that uh, the people of God are also part of uh, judgment um, in the church. Um, he studied uh, specific documents and tried to critically analyze the apostolic uh, uh, some of the um, apostolic manuscripts, manuscripts in the apostolic tradition that existed in the church until the until mid fourth century, and the way it describes uh, the court in the church, he says, we he uh, judges to be close to what is said in Matthew eighteen and to what the apostle Paul says in Corinthians and as well, and he also quotes some of the early church fathers uh, and the way they interpreted these texts. Uh, for instance, he quotes in John Chrysostom and he says, according to this tradition, um, judicial power in the church belonged to the whole of the Christian community headed by the, the bishop and not just the hierarchy. And the church was led by this tradition in organizing its life. Now the next point is that the people also had uh, the power to choose and appoint its hierarchy. He writes an article about um, electing bishops in the uh, um, in the early church. Uh, he studies. Um, um, St. Ignatius, St. Cyprian of Carthage, Origen, and some other church writers, and he says that uh, their writings testify to the fact that there was that uh, electing clergy was a normal practice of apostolic and uh, indeed a few centuries after uh, the apostolic time in the church in Jerusalem, in Antioch, in, in Carthage, in Alexandria. Uh, there was a canon, for instance, for pre Nicene canon for electing bishops, uh, which read the bishop is elected by the whole church, by the clergy and the people, in the presence of everybody, or at least the bishops from the province. And uh, those who are absent have to still cast their vote um, in writing. And this um, election then um, follows by a test. Uh, the elect, the, the bishop elect is then tested through the witness and approval of the church, i.e. the clergy and the people. But it's not for nothing that as early as the fourth century, there was the third rule of, of the council in Laodicea, where the gatherings of people are not allowed to take part in the election of, uh, of the clergy. And then the third rule of the seventh ecumenical council tried to completely remove lay people 
from the process of election. And Aksakov, when he studied this sort of gradual alienation of the ministry of the people of God, uh, he comes to the conclusion that it happened in a period uh, marked by the reforms of Emperor Justinian, when in the church life, instead of the old, the ancient church canons, there were all sorts of uh, new um, rules and, and, and the true meaning of the canons was gradually forgotten. Um, and it was at this time that uh, the number of church ministries was reduced and they were institutionalized. And however, it probably has to do with the gradual disappearance from the dogmatic thinking of the church, of the teaching of the um, universal priesthood of the people of God and the destruction of the Christian community, which um, led to processes of secularism that started well before Christianity became uh, an accepted religion. Aksaka points out that the church, that there were certain alien things that found their way into the church and he tried um, to critically uh, study the notions of clergy and laity, he says that there was never a clay uh, um, in that in the Greek language, uh, uh, the word, the Russian word that is now used for laity came in the 18th century. He uses it, however, simply because it was something well accepted. But he uh, was trying to fill it with a new meaning. First of all, he argues against uh, making a clear opposition between uh, things of this world and things spiritual. He says, there are worldly things that both the clergy and those who are uh, not part of the clergy they're both involved in that. Uh, and becoming a person of this world is not, this doesn't happen because you have to do things of this world, but rather because when you deny your calling in God, if you are steeped in your worldly affairs and you don't want to work for the church, he says, St. Basil, for instance, uh, he called um, singers and people under penance to be part of that category of lay people. In the early church, as Aksakov points out, all the people were called faithful disciples and brothers. A faithful or a lay person is a certain calling as it is a rela it relates up to calling from the very Lord and the church indeed is called because people come not of their own will but because they're called by God to a certain ministry so all the people of God um, are all the members of the church are therefore ordained to perform a certain ministry uh, and that ordination happens in the sacrament of baptism. They can be then appointed to do certain ministries, but that does not remove them from the people of God. And uh, it, it is in that that they have the main grace. So being part of the God, of the people of God is the basis for every other ministry in the church. This is just the original grace that is being applied, as it were, to the various needs of the church. So, and indeed, um, he argues that if there was need for new ministries in the church, that these could be created, but people did not step, uh, stop being part of the people of God. And the clergy were set apart, just as you set apart a certain part of the whole, yet the whole, as it is headed 
uh, the whole church as it is headed uh, by the bishop then um, has the power to appoint people to these different uh, roles. So Aksakov then comes up with this teaching. Um, he says, the church is the clergy of God, made up of faithful people who live within a Christian community and um, live out um, their calling in the various uh, aspects um, uh, of its life, in um, liturgical ministry, in election and appointment for ministries, in um, organization, um, governance and judgment. And it is that common ministry of the whole people of God that realizes the basis, uh, the, the main characteristic of the church, which is sobornus. Um, and on the other hand, the alienation of the people of God from ministry then reduce that quality of sobornus and make the life of the body of the church deficient. And indeed, Aksakov's ecclesiology is really inspired by his faith in the church as the people of God. Uh, it's not for nothing that in his works you can find a lot of quotes from St. Ambrosius, uh, who then he added, to which he added, he said, the church uh, does everything as one. Uh, it, it prays as one, it works as one, it is being tested as one in a uh, collectively. And, and then to that we must add that this is the way it is governed and uh, performs all its sacraments. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Marina, for making this very clear. And for many of us who listened to you, rejoiced in the spirit um, that uh, it's so clearly and um, so concisely you can actually speak about the participation of the people of God in the life of the church as a whole. And I think uh, the arguments against using uh, the word lay, um, lay person as it is used in Russian, it's, a, there's, it's an interesting point that you made that it came from Germany, uh, the word we currently use in Russian. But now we expect questions. Two hands I can see. Uh, let's ask Yulia to uh, to be f to be first. Okay, Yulia Balakshin. Uh, Marina, thank you very much, particularly for restoring uh, Nikolai Aksakov in the history of theological thought. This is so important. Now, my question has to do with what you know in the previous presentation, they said that Homikov, he could never have foreseen what happened, uh, that the Constantinian era would actually end, and he never took that into consideration. Now, Aksakov lives in a different time. He is a witness of, uh, that this connection between the church and the state is becoming to fall apart, even uh, though in his lifetime that separation was never made complete. Now, what I want to ask, you know, that image of the unity of the church and the ministry of the people of God, is that still a theological ideal? Or it, is it already connected to the historic reality in which he lived? Thank you for this question. You know, we know from his biography that when Aksakov studied in Germany, And so this famous priest who wrote about him, Nicholas Antonov. And he says that from the very young age, he was seeking communal life, even in the Protestant Germany. He was looking for communities and he never found them in the religious communities. And he 
and it, the impression is that he continues with that search as he comes back to Russia after his uh, studies in Germany. He keeps seeking that and maybe he found um, sort of little traces of it in the circles that uh, were created around him. For instance, we know that he was part of the, the so-called group of 32 Mm, and then there was a friendly circle of priests and and lay people w in which he was in close communication. So he continues to look for that, but um, a real specific um, realization of his hopes is something that I think never happened. He, it, he didn't find the opportunities, for instance, that New Blue found. Um, just, just these friendly circles, I think, is, is all who he found, with whom he found certain affinity of faith. Dmitry, yes, please. Thank you, Marina. Um, my question is this. Uh, there's the universal and the individual ministries, right? And you said that the, the, there is the ministry of the faithful, which is the foundation for unity in the church, which is a very, uh, which is a great thought by Aksakov. But then there's this distinction between the universal ministry and the individual ministry. Obviously, you know, belonging to the universal ministry of the church is something that everybody has, right? Every, all Christians are called to do that. But the question is, are all Christians, all the faithful, are supposed to have their individual ministries? Or is this, again, some chosen people one way or another whether it's from above to have a special calling or or how would you answer or how did Aksakov answer that I have not uh, seen anything any sort of discussion at that point in Aksakov's work as to uh, whether everybody's called to these special ministries or not. He was basically saying and stressed it. It is that it is the Holy Spirit who elects people for ministry and that the church then bears witness that that is the case and then empowers people to perform the ministry. And he said his main thought was also was that uh, the number of ministries is not at all limited. You know, as many as the church needs. And I think if you can take that as a starting point, I think he would have admitted the possibility that these special ministries, at least I want to believe that, that every Christian could have that. that every Christian is not just called to be part of this general ministry of the people of God, but when you grow into a certain stature, into um, a certain a maturity in your faith, that you that there is a personal calling. And this can be possible for every person. There's no limit. There shouldn't be any limits there. If there is a need in the church and the, the person is gifted, then that person can be appointed to this ministry. His thought is, was that you, there shouldn't be any barriers, artificial barriers that, that appeared at a certain historic um, point in the church. That, 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 that everybody can have a special ministry, there's no doubt, but should they? Well, everybody should seek to have one. I think it's not, you're called 
I, I don't think it's a must sort of thing. It's you can have various internal reasons why you don't have a ministry. But I think seeking and um, uh, striving to get one is something that you are called to be. Okay. We have one more. Aristide um, wanted to speak. Marina, mi sentite? Ok. Yes, e, I'm glad to... Mi è molto piaciuta la tua relazione. In particolare, eh, ho pensato a come nella Chiesa occidentale si è cominciato a parlare di popolo di Dio con il Concilio Vaticano II. E questa è una cosa abbastanza importante e problematica. Una uh, delle attività che questo Papa attuale ha cominciato a fare... Uh, aspetta che provo... Allora, ok. Allora, tengo la camera. È, è, è accesa la camera? Mi vedete? Pronto? Ok. Dicevo questo, che quindi... Eh, Prima di parlare di sacerdozio dei fedeli siamo ancora lontani. Però questo Papa nel primo anno del suo pontificato ha battuto ferocemente contro il clericalismo. E io credo che la ripresa dei concetti che tu hai espresso sia il vero antidoto contro il deserto della fede che abbiamo in Occidente. O i cristiani diventano loro i protagonisti della loro fede e entrano al servizio delle chiese, altrimenti diventiamo delle mummie chiusi nei nostri sarcofagi. Grazie. Grazie mille. Ovviamente mi è molto interessante. Ho capito cosa stai parlando. Ovviamente i documenti del Vaticano II and specifically uh, the um, Lumina Gentium, the, the Constitution. And of course, it's just wonderful that, that this document came to be and that there was a talk about, you know, the church being the people of God. So the only question here is that is this, it's the standing of both the the clergy and the laity, are they equal within the people of God? Can they perform their ministry according to the gift or do the clergy have uh, some sort of special standing? And this is the, the big issue for me. Okay, Marina, uh, my last question then. Now, Aksakov's position is very clear, very deep, uh, very much rooted in the church, and it's, it's a very good position, but in some of, one of the questions you could hear that, but this is something that needs to be revived. His position is not quite realized in the church. It's not that it is being criticized, it's just not realized. Now, is there anybody else who is researching Exarchive and how much? I don't know any, well, I've spent a few years researching his heritage and I don't know anybody else. And I do try to trace publications that have to do with him. I know he's being mentioned in various <coughs> uh, research papers, Elena Belyakova and Father uh, Pavel Honzinski, who has been mentioned today in a more critical uh, context, but I am I know of no special res research dedicated to him. Well, this makes it, your research even more valuable, and hopefully he can find a proper place in heritage of the church, and that we can actually live out. That we can actually. It's not just his personal view. This is something that he does on the basis of the tradition of the church, something that has already been there. Thank you very much then. And we pass on to the next presentation by David David Zahn.
professor at St. Philip Arts Institute. He will be speaking about uh, unity in the church as interpreted by uh, George Bob Parker. Um, thank you very much. I should have probably corrected the title of my presentation, but I, I felt this would be uh, in breach of academic discipline. So I use the word interpretation of uh, Father Sergius Bulgakov based on his book. Uh, but uh, in reality, this was not an interpretation. Uh, this was a, a, a provocation by Father Sergius Bulgakov because if anybody who knows the text and the history of this text, they would all agree that this was a very conscious and a very precise uh, theological and indeed a spiritual and emotional provocation that uh, had to do with uh, what we now call the Russian catastrophe, which is which means the Russian Revolution of 1917, and the way Father Sergius Bulgakov in these uh, circumstances felt when everything was around him was being destroyed and the very fact of existence of, of the church was under threat, you know, meaning the canonical structure of the Russian Orthodox Church, which at the time, which was, was called uh, as the Russian Eastern Greek uh, Church. When I was reading, uh, rereading this book, I was so impressed. And I was, that I was kind of uh, mourning the fact that it is not, uh, that it is not part of the scholarly program of all those theological educational establishments, any, any one of them. Uh, because this is talking about at the walls of of Kisanesis, uh, because you know anything you find, any dialogue, any opposition that you find in the text, you, you run into a problem that um, seems to come up again and again in the whole of the history of the church. As far as I know. Uh, other words of, of Kersenesis is not something, is not a book that everybody would have read. I'll try to remind you the way it is done. This is like an imaginary dialogue, and it's a genre that's not uh, accidental. It's This is coming from antiquity, from the Middle Ages, uh, to discuss the most problematic and, and important and challenging questions. In this imaginary dialogue, the participants, uh, as the alter ego of Bulgakov, as we know, represented in, in two persons, sorry. Uh, the first one is called uh, a refugee, and the second person is a parish priest. Now, the refugee uh, I'm saying is a very, uh, the, the very notion, the very word uh, is very meaningful because it's a person who feels who's, he has lost uh, his home. And this is a spiritual condition. And this refugee is looking for a new shelter. And in, a, in the uh, stable, mm, building the edifice of the Roman Catholic Church. Father Sergius Bulgakov, when he wrote an introduction to this, uh, to a new publication of this book, admitted 
that this was uh, albeit a brief but a very real desire of him trying to find shelter in the Roman Catholic Church. And the question is then why? Now, the, the answer to the why is really the content of the whole dialogue, which doesn't have an end, doesn't have a conclusion, really. The main theme of the dialogue, and apart from this refugee, there, there are also other participants, like other characters who represent various positions um some of them you would call you know fundamentalism probably or or maybe um a not extreme fundamentalism but yet it's a position of a person who is completely um secure in his own idea of orthodoxy and the refugee keeps attacking that position and then there's this parish priest uh, which talks about questions of piety, and his position kind of sounds a lot more uh, uh, thought through. And, uh, and the, they're talking about overcoming the paralysis that was described by Dostoevsky uh, with all its glaring conviction, which uh, became so apparent in those days when the church seemed powerless to resist the destruction around it. And the refugee then, the outer ego of Bulgakov, criticizes the church by saying that orthodoxy and now I'm going to retell uh, the points and then I'll, I'll make some quotes. Now, he says that orthodoxy as we know it um, is an ambiguous phenomenon. Because it tries to bring together incompatible things, the institutional and the canonical. And the relation between the two is not obvious. So this joining is kind of mechanical or artificial. You don't know which comes first, which comes second, which defines the other. And the refugee then says, in the Roman Catholic Church, on the other hand, it's much, things are much clearer. The institutional is dominant and holds the whole structure together and keeps it stable. And that primacy of the institutional aspect, uh, uh, the refugee argues, allows the charismatic part to be also uh, existent and existent in a, uh, in a uh, way without any impediments. So, so that stability sort of allows the charismatic to be there as well. With the obvious primacy of the institutional, the charismatic is still there. And this uh, structure is is well secured, well protected from any destruction from without. And it is only in the orthodoxy with its ambiguity uh, that there is this constant risk of falling apart within its historic body because it hasn't decided. The way the West has decided, obviously, in the in the form of the Roman Catholic Church, because within that dialogue, you always have uh, this sort of ghost of Protestantism. 
but uh, the refugee thinks that orthodoxy is always at risk, uh, is always at risk of falling into something that was, was called anarchical Protestantism. This is, and that anarchy is always something that you can, that you can find, that you can always. Now, the foundation Uh, he says the government in the church is personified and it's a charism and therefore it is not given to groups of people, it is given to specific individuals. And to any objections in relation to the Moscow Council of 1917 that, and that it's it, uh, and yet it restored, you know, this one person's primacy in the church. He says that the patriarch, he objects saying that he, the position of the patriarch is incom incomparable to the Pope because he's, whether it is he, whether he personifies power in the church or whether he's a symbol of unity. If he is a symbol of unity, he doesn't have any power. If he is the person with the most power and the greatest hierarchy is the one that uh, provides stability to the whole system. But in reality, his power is, is no greater than the local bishops who governs his own diocese. Now, in the history of orthodoxy, uh, in the nearest sort of past and present and future, uh, what else was there in orthodoxy? Well, some of the people we've already mentioned today. Uh, so these, and Dostoevsky, and refugee, the refugee criticizes both. Now Dostoevsky, he says, trying in the legend of the great inquisitor, trying to make a caricature, caricature of the Roman, of the Roman church, but he, but he actually made a character of all church governance and all power in the church and that he became together with Homikov, he dissolved it in freedom and love. And he says, and unity and freedom and love, which, which guarantees the charisma, the charisma of unity, how is that unity institutionalized. How can you live it out? How does it work in history? And this is the argument of the refugee. And obviously, the answer to that from the other partners of the dialogue does, is, is non-existent. They can't answer that. And there's a similar story with um, doctrinal authority, okay? The refugee says, does the council represent doctrinal authority of the church? And he says, the conciliar nature, uh, the pre-second, pre-Vatican II in the Catholic church, and this is obviously a very this is, he's, uh, I'm sorry to quote this. <laughs> I apologize to my Catholic friends here, but this is a provocation. Okay, don't think uh, that we're supporting this, but it is this character. Okay, he says 
it, that it is the Pope's position that legitimizes the verdict of the councils. It is when the Pope, who verifies, and, and, and it's not the people of God who is the preserver of tradition and so on, and that makes it possible to, to have some stability. Now, I keep quoting the refugee here, so the provocator. Okay, now what do we have? So I, I would, this is not as a uh, and in interpretation that I would second, obviously, but this is in the same way as in the case of freedom and love, you, we don't have the theologically verified instruments through which a true, not a symbolic or imagined doctrine or authority of the church can be realized. And the refugee points that out. Why is there such ambiguity in orthodoxy? You have the decrees of the ecumenical councils, and then he says, and now this is a provocation again. He says, there's an ambiguity of reception. Why ambiguity? Because he says, Only the instruments that help that reception to take place. When do we learn that this reception has taken place? How and when this instrument can be institu institutionalized? How does it work? When can we point out to the results? When can we say that the reception has taken place? And it's, it's easy enough to react to that. It says, in the history of ecumenical councils, there were heretics who never gave up and kept sort of raising their head. And yet, eventually, there was the dogmatic miracle of recession of the, of the decrees of ecumenical councils, just like the Nicene Creed and some other uh, ecumenical um, documents of the ecumenical council. So instead of pointing to working instruments and institutional mechanisms, we are, uh, uh, we receive these sort of spiritual vague talk. Now this again refers to the phenomenon of of historic orthodoxy and in truth you either have the domination of institutional dominance or sometimes occasionally uh, you know people appealing to these sort of uh, things uh, called reception and it's never stated explicitly where or how you find it. Uh, they, they, they use this as the gem of the Nicene Creed. Take away the word of the gem, and you find yourself without any mechanism of reception. It is declared, but only declared. And then the refugee goes on to attack and says, orthodoxy as much uh, 
uh, he says it's it's um, infected with Protestantism from top to, from top to bottom. It's willfulness. We have no internal uh, ecclesial nature. We do not think uh, ecclesiologically when we talk about orthodoxy. Everybody talks about their own understanding of it and their own position in it. Orthodoxy is always uh, an, uh, the unknown, not the known part. It's a problem of philosophy. The refugee who should have probably said not religion, but faith. But that's not what he does. And the people who too are talking to him are never convicted, convincing, because they keep talking in slogans. I believe in the continuous action of grace in the church. I, I believe in the continuity of the life of the church. And that is something that both agree with that with everything that happened with the Russian church that it has found itself paralyzed and that there are special efforts necessary to overcome that. But it is only the fundamentalist that sees it in a way. Again, I'll try to, to summarize his point of view. He says the paralysis will overcome itself because of the continuity of the life of the church, because the church itself is a miracle. So you say there'll be a miracle and the Lord will heal the paralyzed man. Don't worry. How? This is again Protestant rationalism, which you're trying to impose on it. And that's it. And the problem is closed. Now, I've said it again and again that in this little, it's about a hundred pages, in this little text, each problem that is raised deserves a special theological treatise. And I don't have the time, but I try to make a resume. So the conclusions of the provocation that Father Father Serge has made in this in this text. The conflict that he that Bulgakov's alter ego, the refugee states, and which is a the collision between the institutional and the charismatic. Uh, does it exist? Obviously. Now, let's say that the refugee is wrong and uh, his solution is not acceptable. But what is the alternative without just uh, making a declaration? The actual alternative is what? In his interpretation, the, the charismatic needs to be uh, lived out with the domination of the institutional and the administrative over it. And the risk is known is that uh, because it becomes, because the charismatic becomes, um, uh, strictly speaking, unnecessary, and the risk is that it will be lost altogether, emptied. Then the sacraments become self-performed, and as the, the, the 
that there is love and sacraments and all of that happens in the church thanks to the existence of the, uh, the institution and the hierarch with absolute power. But it is also none less obvious, particularly when you read this book, is that a simple combination between the institutional and the charismatic, just sort of making it, making uh, an institutional structure being complemented with the charismatic is even less convincing and has the same risk of leaving out the spirit. Because in this combination, which we sometimes often find in historic orthodoxy, we find a position according to which orthodoxy is a, a realized fullness of the action of the spirit. So much so that the Holy Spirit has no place to act anymore. Well, he breathes where he chooses. Nobody argues against that. But the fullness that was displayed in the seven ecumenical councils and the, the fullness uh, of all others in the riches of worship, in the in the uh, inspiration of the language and the statutes, uh, there's a there's a higher monk there as one of the characters who explains this position. He says, he says that the language of the church is inspired and the very rules of the church are inspired. And he says all of this fullness that leaves basically no space and no choice for the Holy Spirit to act. The only thing he can do is act within the framework of this fullness. And, there, and then how did the paralysis and the crisis happen? What is the way out? I think the way out is in a very radical uh, Dostoevsky's um, acting union between peace and love, Dostoevsky's and Hanukkah's, needs to be lived out in an institution which is called a gathering of the friends of Christ to have full responsibility for that love and for that performance. And then the love of Christ is capable of producing all the necessary forms, physical forms, for the church to exist. The church doesn't run away from problems. The problems are not just the soul of philosophy. The church is a space and an opportunity for all problems and paradoxes to be resolved, except that the character of this resolution uh, represents the very continuous life that uh, accumulates that experience of unity and love and therefore bringing people to a new experience of uh, agreement and consensus, consensus in the main things. Now, why uh, would you have it that way? Because this is the only opportunity, the only true opportunity to state its presence in the world, to reveal its presence in the world, and to bring salvation into that world. Apart from the spiritual space in which uh, the apostles work and which belongs to Christ. The church therefore uh, receives a certain physical space and a place where quite physically and uh, quite tangibly it can state its presence. 
um, clearly and accessibly, and I'm done. Thank you, David, for this brilliant and provocative presentation. <laughs> And, and the questions you raise in this brilliant way. Now, what you show uh, from Bulgakov, I think, uh, at the walls of Kursanisis is something everybody is now going to read. But before uh, anybody else is given the floor, I have some doubt that I want to resolve. Now, you you finished that there is saying that there is a possibility of a synthesis, but um, the book was written at a time where Bulgakov was obviously leaning one way. He had some Catholic sympathies. He, you know, Russia was in a very difficult situation and the Orthodox Church and he he said he saw this as a way out you know the the Christian West were 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 you know things are stable and defined and even though he was uh, as he says was healed from that longing but at the time when he wrote it uh, it was not the beautiful synthesis that you are referring to. He wanted to go to go west, to go into that. And I don't know, could you just present, it's a provocation again, could you just press and leave it open, leave your question open without sort of trying to close the issue? Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a temptation to leave the provocation a provocation and to sort of, uh, and this was be, would have been right because, you know, the, the, the end, the conclusion, uh, and that I provided at the end within two or three minutes that I had is really not doing justice to the issue doesn't really provide a real alternative but i uh i didn't want to stop it would have been right if i had because i started with the fact that the problems that the participants of this dialogue is it's a problems that run through the whole history of the church and it would have been very naive to think that that we know the ways out. A general prospect though is something that we can see and even today in the in the first part of our conference I I could I kept seeing it, you know, I was I was wondering at it, you know. Some uh, called for the restoration of the New Testament image of the church and the restoration specifically. Then we have this theme of the people of God that is very powerful. And then particularly when I, I was listening to Oksak of, uh, as quoted by Marina, I kept sort of saying, you know, my turn will come and I'll, you know, I'll tell you. It's true, it's true. The provocation of the refugee stands. We don't have the instruments for realizing that unity. And yet there is real experience that gives us hope. And I would use the word hope as a key word that the refugee doesn't use. Um, I'm sorry, I will not. Um, you can see the question from Dmitry uh, in the chat, but I will not 
I will not thank you for the question, but I think the David has already answered it. And um, now we move on to the final presentation of, uh, of this session. I would like Olga Kuznetsova, who's in charge of the um, free bachelor's program at the Tillerets, and uh, she's also a student at the um, postgraduate and PhD studies. Um, she will be talking about the physiology of uh, Father Nicholas Athanasiev, the unity of ministries in the church. Again, another great figure of the 19th and 20th century. So Olga will be speaking now. Thank you very much, dear fathers and the participants of our conference. I'm happy to see you all, and I'm happy that this conference still is being held despite of our circumstances. My presentation is dedicated to the ecclesiology of Father Nikolai Afanasyev. We have just corresponded with Marina, and uh, the thoughts Marina has uh, said are very similar to what we know in our presentation. So sorry for some repetitions I might have, but probably Afanasyev was thinking actually on his own, and you cannot say that he was just, you know, rewriting Exarchov. He was coming to these conclusions himself. In the modern Orthodox ecclesiology, the issue of the universal ministry of all the members of the church uh, is posed by Afanasyev. And he says that not only by those who were ordained into some specific order, but also to those whom scholarly theology names laymen. And while examining the process of transformation of the initial understanding of faithful as uh, members of people of God, he actually publishes in 1948 his first article, The Holy Nation. Later on, this uh, work was revised and it was published in 1955 as a separate book named The Layman Ministry in the Church. And then some more additional changes uh, concerning the structure of the text. This book became the first part of his dissertation, The Church of the Holy Spirit. Besides, uh, Father Nikolai uh, has answered the review of Father John Mindorf in 1956 about the uh, management and teaching in church. So these are the sources which we are based on uh, while talking about his ecclesiology. In Western theological thought, the idea that the ministry is not only refers to clergy and laymen uh, is thought over in much more detail. And the teaching of the role of laymen in the church life is reflected in the dogmatic constitution of the church lumen gentium. In the 33rd article, layman apostolate is defined as a participation in salvation mission of church, and everyone is intended to the apostolate by God, by baptism and confirmation. So uh, uh, the decree of layman apostolate also is saying about that. The attention of the Western theology and role of layman does not eliminate those differences between the ministers, between church, clergy and laymen. And it is just the same one as Apostle Paul had the help with the men and women. So they all have their role in the salvation act of the church. It should be noted that the teaching of the apostles of the faithful is actually a fruit of uh, Second Vatican uh, participants' uh, efforts. But uh, Father Nicolae Afanasius harshly criticizes the Catholic understanding of rigid division of the church into clergy and laymen. The latter remain so passive that one can conclude that the church life can also can go on without laymen. However, the life of church itself disproves this very argument, while the Catholic Church actually has in its depth the true teaching of the 
church structure. So you can even have baptism held by laymen and also those who, for example, get married, they also participate themselves in that sacrament. In later works, Father Nikolai does not consider these issues and uh, while considering Protestant ecclesiology, uh, Father Nikolai Afanasyev uh, can draw attention to those consequences that can deny hierarchy as a separate class. Understanding church as a homogeneous understanding led Protestants, as Father Nicholas thinks, to reconstruct to the reconstruction of the initial Christian understanding of the face in the face of God because everyone has same gracious gifts and at the same time this ordination uh, was considered as an assignment so it was rather understood as administratively and legally uh, something legal and administrative and uh, but not a gracious act an orthodox the orthodox approach to different uh, church ministries also went through a number of changes generally the orthodox teaching inherits catholic theology understanding uh, about non homogeneous uh, state of the church assembly and we have also actually three separate classes laymen clergy and monks and they have quite uh, different uh, characteristics so understanding this actually uh, the uh, clerical coordination and monastic coordination actually changed the ontological nature of human and gradually it leads that to the fact that as if uh, they assume it as a higher baptism and a new birth of man but you cannot accept the fact that baptism is something imperfect and thus needs to be made complete or perfect Father Nicolai does not pose this question, but he notes that the pro-Orthodox tradition is not actually the only one, and it keeps the variety, and it lets the truth shine even through the thickness of scholarly doctrine. As a true core, uh, Father Afanasyev accepts the teaching of the universal priesthood, considering the life of church, he emphasizes the words from Holy Scripture where it says of the royal priesthood of all the people of God. And he has a number of quotations like that. And I can read just one of that, so one of them. So it's about the resurrection number one. The second death has no authority on him and they will reign with him a thousand years. It's the Revelation chapter 20. Father Nicolai actually thinks that this refers, this applies to all the Christians, but the difficulty is that the church doesn't know what to do with that because this uh, universal priesthood is almost forgotten. It is almost a dead letter, but not the spirit. The only mention that, but very cautiously, so not to be blamed at all of the Protestant bias. And let me draw your attention that Afanasyev was talking about that in 1948. But uh, reconstruction of this teaching of the universal priesthood can actually revive the church. And the, for Afanasyev, the base of the priesthood of the faithful is actually their ordination in, the, in baptism and confirmation as a royal priesthood because everyone has grace and ministry because church cannot have anyone without a gracious ministry so it means that church is actually only people who carry out their ministries and have the gift of the holy spirit and the whole people are actually clergy so every layman is actually as a member of people of God is at the same time a clergyman. The main, one of the important characteristics of the new era of the priesthood
as Father Nicholas said, that everyone belongs to church because he carries out ministry to God. And you cannot think of one or another man as if he was a, somewhere higher. We live and we exist. And as some of your poems said, we are of him, of his inheritance. The teaching of universal priesthood does not let us a slightest, does not give us a slightest uh, possibility to pose the question of non-homogeneous uh, church assembly. It asserts the principal ontological unity of the nature of the, all the members of the church. So we don't need any additional uh, uh, ordination. We all get in our baptism. However, besides the universal ministry, we have some specific ministries as well. And those who have specific gift can carry out those ministries. And the difference is just uh, not because someone uh, has the lack of grace, because Afanasyev stresses that all have the same grace and because everyone is endowed by the same spirit. There are differences in uh, gifts, but the spirit is the same. And the difference of the ministers is just because the gifts are different. So uh, having different ministries and gifts, the fullness of grace is bestowed on every member of the people of God. But it doesn't mean that everyone fully embraces it. They only embrace it as much as they, their heart comprises it. And you cannot uh, apply the, the, to spirit the quantitative characteristics. So you can only uh, say that this difference has nothing to do with the specific ministers. So it's the difference, not only, it's not an ontological difference, but a functional difference. For fully functioning of the church organisms, we need all variety of the talents and gifts. New Testament has a number of lists of such gifts and they do have some hierarchical ladder. And as Father Nikolai thinks that this hierarchical ladder actually starts from lay in a near sense of the word and it ends in bishop and it ends in Christ himself. Bishop is the one who lays ahead in the assembly, having a specific gift and a specific vocation. Uh, maybe one can conclude that this contradicts uh, with the principle of the universal priesthood, but Afanasyev does have an answer to that. There's no contradiction if you do not forget the initial, uh, the initial authority of the hierarchy as, in, and as an authority of love because without love, the, there is no hierarchical ministry, or this authority is just uh, something different. For Father Nikolai, he, he always said that you have to come to initial meanings of all the things. Universal priesthood includes the priesthood of the bishop, priesthood of presbyters, and priesthood of lakes giving accent to clergy in a near sense, just due to their specific charisma, but not because they are higher or something different to, to all the rest of the people. Examining the ministries related to the life of the church, uh, Father Nikolai doesn't pay attention to many other issues and the conclusion he comes uh, are quite brief. Priesthood is applied to every member of the church because one uh, just lays ahead of the assembly, but laymen are those who are managed and taught and their authority and their responsibility is to recept and to agree with what they are taught and they have to carry out their ministry that this 
ministry is delivered to them in dignity and in compliance with the church. The difference does not create division in, within the church. But we have to tell the uh, ministries because uh, so that everyone can deal with the, what he actually responsible for. So um, coming to the conclusion that it actually helps us to fully elicit early Christian heritage and to see the highness of every single man in church. And so these different ministries are actually two sides of the same coin and they don't come into contradiction uh, with one another. The only problem is to embrace the real teaching of church hierarchy acting by means of love and find the ways to forgotten church heritage and unity of ministries of all the people of church. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. You have posed a very difficult task. It's not the only problem. It's, it's, uh, it must be named something different. So please, uh, the participants, you can ask your questions if you have. I hope you're not too tired and have some question. Please, Marina Naumova. Thank you for your presentation, Olga. My question is about what's your attitude to the Aksakov's uh, position when he says that he expels laymen out of those who can uh, carry out you mean, uh, you mean Afanasyev? Yeah, yes, yes, you're right. I'm talking about Afanasyev, of course. Uh, the position of Afanasyev. But Aksakov actually didn't expel laymen. He was saying that laymen could actually take part in management and in teaching. But what do you think of Father Nikolai Afanasyev? Because he was, you know, saying that Laymen could not take part in management. What's your attitude? Well, uh, concerning the uh, church teaching, I can't agree with Father Nikolai, who asserts that the modern church structure, which lacks a separate institute of those teachers who were teaching the people, uh, so the bishops are looking after that. I believe that the 20th century and the Russian Orthodox Church uh, under the circumstances of uh, uh, showed that laymen can really preach and uh, teach the people, but not everyone, of course. Not every layman can carry out that ministry, so it must be something sort of a personal gift but maybe this is just some sort of you know the beginning of those teachers institute within the church but coming to the church management i believe it's one of the most difficult issues because afanasyev is saying that you also have to have a specific gift to church management and uh, that's what uh, bishops being, uh, you know, ordained because laymen believe he can do that. But anyway, what is the life of those laymen? Because who can be involved uh, in some way to the management of the church? And the council in Moscow was actually trying to find the answers to those questions whom we can invite and involve in that ministry. So the question is not that easy. You cannot just say yes, because it won't be actually an answer, because we do have to take into account the quality of the life of the people. It's not a formal way to figure it out. So it's quite a problematic question. I would say that it could be possible, but if one is a real layman, but not just a worldly person. I believe it's a serious topic to discuss, 
Uh, I would not like to just finish it this way, but Olga, I believe you a little bit simplified. Let, let us come to the complexity of this issue. What sort of the layman? He can be a saint, man, but on the other hand, we have a certain church concept that a layman cannot teach the church. Could you please rectify? Could you please say that if would anyone, any sermon pronounced it in church be a church teaching? So maybe the question is not what a layman is like, but the question is uh, what uh, aspects are taken and uh, taken into account and who called him to that ministry? So the same question is to the church management. Could you please tell a couple of words what you think and then I will add something? Well, you're right, this is not that easy and uh, we do care what we hear in church, but we do care what the bishop says also. He has this power, but sometimes bishops actually do not teach their sermon are not actually a teaching they only you know retelling the meaning of the holiday or a scripture so uh, we do have some difficulties among those who were ordained to that ministry so we have the same problem with the layman and besides we have some examples when after the great moscow council some laymen were involved in sermon and we know some modern examples and real uh, laymen teach and preach and it's a real church ministry uh, though uh, nobody ordained them to that it's only performed by gift of spirit yes so you have to tell between teaching of the church and between teach what actually teachers do okay thank you well, what about the church management? There's some, you know, tricky point. What do you think? Is it enough to involve a layman into some church institution so that he can, you know, take part in church management? And what are the criteria and the bonds between the bishop and the church and the whole church body. Could you actually talk about the church bound if you don't have these bounds? What would you say about this? Father Nikolai Afanasyev is actually not uh, caring, not about talking about you shouldn't involve laymen into that. He only says that you don't have to rely on democratic principle when everyone has to say something and he has a right to say something so he is arguing actually with that principle so not all the classes of within the church can can you know do that we have some different ministers but father nikolai stresses that this is a serious uh, point which needs to be developed and which needs to be managed by the spirit of God. So the authority of bishop as an as an authority of love. So this is a real powerful thought, because church is managed uh, not by 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 law like like that in state. Uh, so we're not talking about laws simply. But the authority of love is actually a totally, is absolutely different basis. So if you, uh, if layman can share that participation, then Afanasyev wouldn't deny that. So he is just talking about the organization of church as is. There is a number of problems about this topic there are some difficult moments especially uh, concerning the historical truth yes you're right it's we have some other forms and 
uh, possibilities to discuss such problems and everyone you know actually uh, comes to the problem of the unity of church if we do have the unity within the church then some miracles wonderful things can happen uh, take uh, the preaching take the management anything but if it is not elicited, if it is not, you know, realize it, then there are some difficult questions come arise and they, you know, they, they provoke other problems and you cannot solve all of them and you just being get involved into a complicated matter. So you have to search for unity of the church and it's not, it must not be based on the law it must be based on something inner uh, thing it's like to go on cross okay let's finish on that optimistic note we will finish our session we have almost not lost anyone we are almost 40 people taking part in our conference it's a very good result it means that everybody is interest, interested that the topic is interesting and I hope that we are not just have talked to each other, but we have, you know, some sort of, you know, possibility to go on further and talk when the conference finishes and this discussion will go on. So I would please, I, I can, I give Father Vasilides, Professor Vasilides, ask the word. Professor Vasilides, you can speak. All I wanted was to thank all the presenters of this session, and I would like to make a remark, which I find it very interesting regarding the general subject of this conference. Most of the personalities of the theologians analyzed in this session are not, uh, let's say, in the mainstream modern orthodox theology, but they are very important, I would say even more important than those who are in the center of our orthodox theological debate. So if these people are uh, acknowledged as belonging to the same communion, to the same Eucharistic table in one way or another, although there are different uh, approaches, most notably between Florovsky and Bulgakov, just to mention one, how is it possible not to think about the general unity of the church in cases where sometimes we or some orthodox theologians are closer to non-orthodox to catholics for instance rather than to some other orthodox <laughs> and it's something just for a reflection and further consideration this is what only i would like to uh, uh, say to to this beautiful uh, uh, composition of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vasiliadis. I think we can say that your commentary, you can just say amen to what you have just said. It's really so. Thank so you. this is a problem, but let's go on. We know where to go. So thank you. Have a good nice one, time. everyone. Thanks to all the participants. I wish all the 50 minutes before the next session have a rest and have some uh, wars. And at five o'clock in 50 minutes, we are uh, to, to join at last at our last session. So thank you very much to everyone. See you later. Yeah.